Welcome to This Academic Life, episode 63. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm a professor of physics and associate dean of research. Hi, my name is Pani Anuol. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I am also a professor of mechanical engineering. Well, this year's Nobel Prize had recently announced, and not very surprisingly, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2023 is the inventor of the COVID vaccine. Her name is Catalin Carrico. She was born in 1955. She's a Hungarian-American biochemist. In particularly, her contribution is in the in vitro transcribed messenger RNA for protein replacement therapy, which ultimately set the groundwork for mRNA vaccines that had been widely used as the COVID-19 vaccine. Many resources had come out uh, recently after this announcement. She overcame some major obstacles and skepticism in the research community. Hana, can you give us a basic outline of her academic background, where she has been working and where she is today? Sure. Yeah. As you mentioned that I need to warn the audiences that it does not sound pretty, but she started as an adjunct professor at University of Pennsylvania in 1989. And that's where she met and began collaborating with Drew Wiseman, a professor of medicine at Penn. Then she was initially on the track to become a tenure professor, where the university notified her that uh, she needs to either leave or she needs to be demoted with a pay cut in 1995. And she was having a difficult time. Her husband was stuck in uh, Hungary because of some visa issue. And also she herself was diagnosed with cancer. So she decided to take the risk and accept being demoted instead of uh, leaving the university. So that uh, demotion, she continued her work with uh, Drew Wiseman, and they continued uh, the collaboration to this day. And then later, she became an investigator at Penn, and she started serving as a president of uh, BioNTech. And that's where we know the rest of it, that they managed to come up with the COVID-19 vaccine. When the vaccine came out, I do remember there had been conversations about how many grants she got denied from NIH or some other grants agencies. The inspiring thing for me is that she never stopped trying. And about 10 years ago, she was let go. Articles saying that she was actually fired from Penn or forced uh, early retirement from Penn. In a recent interview, which is very widely publicized of her about this Nobel Prize, she said, I did not say, well, why is it happening to me? Um, I, my work needs to keep going. So she then carried her work, continued to carry out her work in Germany. So that's for another 10 years. In the meantime, of course, trials and tribulations and living apart from her family and all of that, she never gave up. It's so truly amazing the amount of obstacles that she has to go through her entire life, basically, up until this point where she finally got some recognition. Yeah, so for me, what was most inspiring along the same thing that Lucy said was the fact that she always believed you could have both, both a family and a profession, specifically spoke to me as a, a female, as a woman who have friends that feel like we have to choose between going out and spending time with friends and working in the lab. That was something that really gave me goosebumps when she said that. And then the other thing was the fact that her mother believed somehow that she could, her mother would listen for her name being called. And she was like, I'm not even the professor, right? And so 
I, I can think of moments in my life where my grandmother did something similar to me, where people can foresee something in you you can't see in yourself because you are just thinking, look, all of this stuff I have to do, it will never happen. So I think her story is, is very inspirational. And those were the two things that really jumped out at me. Yeah, I also I was going to say that it's very sad for me that the people that she trusted and she worked for them really, really, really hard, they didn't see the potential. And that was because you put all your trust in the organizations that you are working for them. And for me, that was heartbreaking. But she is truly an exceptional person that she has no hard feeling. And she's like, well, I, I use that one. And look at me. Now I'm the winner at the end. I got this Nobel Prize, even though she, she I, I'm sure that she didn't work for the Nobel Prize. She just worked because she really, truly, genuinely believed that that's going to happen. And her mom saw that in her. But other uh, people, they didn't see that. And including that I read in uh, some of the articles that she also, the work that she, she pioneered and started at uh, UPenn, she also submitted to nature and it was rejected from nature. So uh, as Lucy mentioned, there were so many obstacles in her career, but she was just found a way to overcome them. And she came back stronger and stronger and stronger instead of just like, OK, I quit. I'm done. Yeah. And the fact that she worked hard and that translated to her daughter, who is a gold medalist, if I'm not mistaken. And so it just shows you always want your kids to be better than you. And that was just the perfect example of how her daughter went to the top, her expertise and how now her mother has done the same. But it probably started from seeing her mom work hard and subconsciously she did the same thing. So I think that's also very inspirational too, a generational inspiration, <laughs> I should say. Yeah, actually, it reminds me very much of Mary Curie's story that her daughter also became a Nobel Prize winner. And I think that her hard work set a good example for her, her daughter and the sacrifices that both her and her husband, they made because she mentioned in the interview uh, for the uh, after she won the award that she had to go back and forth to, to Germany to continue the research. And I I'm sure it wasn't easy for her husband and her daughter. And one thing she did say at the end of the interview was focus on the things you can change. She said the things that she can change are the fact that Penn fired her. But she knows that her work, she has control over. And she went for it. And she was focused, laser focused. So I think that speaks a lot. And I always think that uh, sometimes we use our strength on the wrong things. Sometimes we lose focus because there are so many things that you can't really change. You can spend all your energy, all your time trying to do something, but it won't change the outcome. But I really love her attitude. It was just so positive. It's so forward looking. She doesn't look back. She just keeps on going forward. So I have a question. So in the interview, because she's so forward looking, of course, there was so many things that I wanted to ask her. And I kind of knew what she was going to say. But I couldn't help to wonder, like, how much of the things she went through was because of gender, was because of the fact that she was female. That was one of the things that that came to mind when I listened to the interview. And I just wanted to ask, do you guys think that any of the things she went through was related to the fact that she was a female, that she was a woman? I'm sure it played a part. But I feel like she didn't use that as a excuse for her work is work. Like th this project is her project and anything that lies or comes in her way, she just go past it and move on. This is my own feeling, how she's dealing with things. I am sure one way or another, something had related to her gender background or whatever it is that had impacted her in some way, but it didn't stop her. Another thing that jumped out at me was 
is there something that made me question how our academic structure is set up when it comes to tenure track, research, faculty members, like all of that? Because I also know some other famous people that got booted out, air quotes, of the university because their time expired for whatever reason. Or is the academic structure we have now like archaic? Is it getting to a point where we're weeding out the wrong people, so to speak, and we should be evaluating based on some other criteria, not that's just not based on how much money you get, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to know if, if that kind of jumped out at you, you a little bit or you didn't think about it when you heard her interview or when you heard Panya talk about her track record in the academy. I personally think, well, there are so many things wrong with the academy that needs to be changed, this included. But I don't think that we are going to learn a lesson. And I I, I think that we are going to move on. And then people, I see every year when we have these Nobel Prize winners being announced, every funding agencies, they are trying to get we supported the research, but they never mentioned how many of their proposals they rejected how, related to the topic. Still in her code, we should focus on what we can control. Uh, and the lesson for me is that I should not let me discouraged and distracted by these negativities around me because I can change the academy. It, it takes way more power than me, but hopefully these stories shake somebody's up and then things will happen maybe in 10 years, 20 years. I think it's an extreme case. Of course, she's very visible now. So her stories are being told and being heard, but I think it happens so often. So you can see that people in enough money, they simply don't get tenure, regardless the quality of their work. They move on to another institution. All of a sudden, they grab money like things falling off the sky. And the previous institution go, oh, maybe we made a mistake. But it's too late. So the decisions had already been made. But you don't see that original institution making a change in the way they reassess or they assess tenure. It's the same thing. The formula would not change. But majority of it is money driven. I think a lot of that resulted in talents got buried. But I have one suggestion for Academy. I think we should have a Grammy and then we should have, oh, bring more recognitions about like not money, like uh, uh, like these Nobel Prize winner. We want to hear their stories. We want our kids and next generations to hear them. We we should like wh- why why not giving attention to these people? Maybe Penn can have their stadium opened up, have uh, one of the most famous singers invite them, and then have the biggest show and reinvent themselves, and then we bring more attention to education. The society does not. It's so hard. We're just so small in numbers, in volume, comparing to the population. We're not popular culture. So unfortunately, science is even less popular than technology. I feel like people embrace technology very fast because we're all users. But science is much harder. They're more abstract. Uh, Typically, they don't come into the daily conversations. And they're also very specialized. So it's hard to break in. But we also have to remember this one particular example. There are a lot of schools that get it wrong. Many schools get it wrong. I could think of times in my career where I applied for something and I didn't get it. And want to think, are they thinking about that they made a mistake? And I remember I had an opportunity to say it out loud. This particular university was in the audience. And it just came over me. It was still inside. I still was feeling some kind of way that I wasn't accepted there. And I made a comment. And here I was. I was being brought back to talk about how well I have done in my career. And I just couldn't help myself. And I said it. And I named the school and everything. Said the year, everything. Afterwards, the representative from the school was 
she she was mortified. She could not believe that that happened. And she kept saying, what can I do to make it right? Like she she just was like, I cannot believe that happened. She was like, what do I need to do? And then it just came over me. I was like, nothing. I think it was supposed to happen that way. And and she just, I, I didn't mean to make her feel bad. I, it just was on my heart. I really wanted to be there. <laughs> and so, so I can think, so sometimes people just get it wrong. We're human. And in that moment, I realized it was really nothing against me. They Sometimes people get it wrong. Not everybody is your mother and believe that, yes, she can do it. So I, I think as we move forward in our own careers, we kind of have to keep that in the back of our mind that sometimes we could get it wrong. And that's why when we talked about the faculty search, we really have to dig deep and figure out, is this a good fit? We have to abide by all of the philosophies that we said on the podcast and forgive ourselves if we if we did make the wrong decision. That's what I think. It's hard. It's it's a hard loss, but it happens. And I'm happy that she mentioned that she didn't just sit there and mope and just sit in that moment forever and ever. But I think we should have the courage to come back and confess that we made a mistake. I think that's one thing that we could do, at least. Yeah, we we face so many people. Um, most of them are just passing by. You, you can't go back and find all these people. I think, Kim, you're on the spot. And I think we can't expect people to get us. I mean, some people know you well. They can get maybe 90% of you, can get into your head and think about what you would think about and and know what your and you know aspirations are. They just know. Uh, but most people maybe know you 10%. If it's just a proposal by simply writing, they know you <laughs> about 0.5%, they will probably get it wrong, make the wrong decision. And that happens. And you have to say, that's okay. You can't just hold grudges and say, why are they all get me wrong? Right? So I, I, it's, um, yeah, we're all humans and we can't expect everyone to get us. Yeah, I guess I need to make a clarification. I meant when somebody gets a Nobel Prize and they get the highest recognition, they need to confess that, oops, we made the biggest mistake, <laughs> not trying to get credit. So that's what I meant. So Kim, I hope that when you get that prize, that university comes back and confess. We will see that day coming. <laughs> Thanks, ladies. I'll, I'll, you're going to be the first, you're going to, well, you're going to be the second people to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, like, of all the work that she had contributed, when she got the call, she was shocked. She, just, she thought people were joking with her. Can you imagine? Like, I would be like, oh, yeah, I got this. But she went, oh, I thought they were joking. Why? You know, like she accomplished so much. I love that she's so humble and just love it. I think this is exactly why she got here in the first place. There's no game. She's just like, she's super focused and just stay humble. Oh. Okay, so, well, thank you. This is a lot of fun to talk about. And we are just in awe with her accomplishments and her experiences. And we hope uh, that our, our audience will get something to take away from her stories. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. You can follow us on Facebook and listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, or Amazon Music. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life. <laughs>